Okay, welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 30, which goes as follows. Appamadena magava devanang setatangato appamadang pasang santi pamado kalahito sada which means Apamade Namagawa by heedfulness or vigilance did Magawa Devanang Setatangato become the king of the angels or the, the head of heaven of the angels, the highest of celestial beings. Apamadang Basang Santi. Uh, heedfulness or vigilance is ever praised pamado karahito sada well uh, negligence is ever uh, scorned so this is a story about a man named Magawa and how through uh, the practice of vigilance he became the highest or the chief of the angels, the chief of all celestial beings. And it says, using this as an example, we can see that, we can understand that uh, vigilance is ever praised and negligence is ever scorned. So people always say, uh, speak down about people who are negligent, and people who are vigilant are always praised and always uh, Rise up, rise above those who are negligent. As we have been learning in this in this vaga, this is a theme that goes through the the Buddha's teaching. The difference between a person who is negligent and a person who is vigilant. A person who is vigilant is likely to meet with uh, success in life and to meet with happiness and praise. In this case, and a person who is negligent will always be scorned and will always lose opportunity and will always fall further and further down in life and, and in the spiritual quest. So Magawa is actually the name, a name given to Saka or Indra, as he's commonly known in Hinduism, the king of the gods. And the king of the gods plays a, somewhat of a role in the Buddha's teaching. Uh, he's said to be a supporter of the Buddha and he comes to see the Buddha and learn from the Buddha and actually becomes a Sotapanna as a result of listening to the Buddha's teaching. Uh, so I'll go briefly through the story of how he became the king of the gods. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I think it's useful as an as a example to us. Um, one of the important things in meditation is to get an example of or an idea of what we're aiming for. When we undertake something, we always want to see what is the result of the practice, what comes of the practice. When you practice in this way, once you've completed the training, or, or as you progress in the, the training, what, what does it lead to? And so, the use of, of an example, taking someone as an example, someone who has passed the course, or someone who has developed their mind, to be able to compare ourselves with them and to realize that um, it would be good for us to develop the qualities that they espouse or the qualities that they have naturally in their minds. This is a good thing for us to, to, to be able to consider. So in this way we can use uh, the King of the Gods and his story as an example for ourselves. When we see the qualities that he had, even though the story itself isn't about meditation, you can see that his mind is quite developed. And if we look at ourselves, we can compare ourselves with him and see the, the qualities that we want to develop, or if we have them, the qualities that we want to keep uh, and, and develop further for the benefit of our, of our uh, minds and of our lives. So the story goes that Magawa was born in a city called Magga. Magga was the city uh, he was born in, thus he was called Magawa. That's his name. The story actually goes that there was in Vesali, we which is a city where the Buddha spent some time, there was a uh, one of the Lichui people called Mahali. 
what's his name, Mah Mahali. And he came to to listen to the Buddha's teaching, and he heard the Buddha's teaching on uh, the questions of, of, of Indra, the questions of Saka, the king of the gods, because the story is he came down and asked the Buddha some questions that were actually very pertinent meditation questions. He asked, why is it that when people want to live in harmony, they can't live in harmony? And then the Buddha said it's because they're some, some, the ones who have are stingy, and the ones who don't have are jealous. And they said, well, where does, where does that come from? And the Buddha said, that comes from their uh, desire, and that comes from their feelings, and, and so on, and explaining how desire comes from feelings, and feelings comes from contact, and so on. He taught the Sakapan, Sakapanha Sutta. And as a result, Saka became a Sotapan. He became enlightened to, to the lowest stage of enlightenment as a result of the teaching. Now, Mah Mahali heard this. And so he, he thought, I've heard, here I've heard the, the Blessed One, the Buddha, has actually met Saka, the king of the gods, or Indra, as he was known at the time. And uh, so he goes and asks the Buddha whether it's true that the Buddha actually met Saka. And the Buddha says, yes, yes, I know Saka, I met Saka. And Mahali says, oh, it must have been a fake Saka. It must have been, it must have been a fake angel because, you know, People are always seeing angels. People here say they see Ganesha. In Thailand, they always say they see Ganesha and and Indra and, and Vishnu and Shiva and so on. And so people are always saying that. And, and the general belief among spiritual people is that most often it's just fake. You're just seeing some lesser angel or some Mara and so on trying to trick you. And the Buddha, he said, because it's very difficult to see the king of the gods. How, how could you possibly have seen Indra. And the Buddha said, well, difficult or not, he said, I know Indra and I know the, the things that made him Indra. I know Saka and I know the things that made him the king of the gods. And here we have a very important teaching in, in Buddhism, something that I want to share today uh, that's in this story. And it's called the, I think it's called the, 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 the Saka Dhamma or the Devan Devaniminda Dhamma, I don't know, it's the, the, the Dhammas of Saka, the seven things that made him, made him Saka. And this is the example that he sets for us. Things that are very important, not in our meditation practice, but very important for us to gain from the meditation practice. So if you want an idea of what you're expected to become, and whether, you, whether you, so you can get an idea of whether it's something that you'd like to become, then you should understand these seven Dhammas, because these are the considered in Buddhism to be the qualities of a highly developed individual, someone who has the potential to become not just a good person, to become the chief or the, the highest, yeah, go to the highest state, become king, become, uh, uh, well, become, like, become a mayor, become a politician, you know, a president or king or, or, or king of the gods, even, to become a leader. So these are the seven dhammas, and they're actually from the Sangyutta Nikaya, but they're they're mentioned here in this in this Dhammapada story as well. And so the verse goes, Mata Peti Barang Jantung, by uh, by caring for his parents for his whole life. Kule Jeta Peja Yinang, by uh, respecting his elders, sanhang sakila sambasang, by using speech that was pleasing and gentle, pesu neya bahayi nang, by giving up uh, or abstaining from slandering others, say, talking badly about others. Machera vinaye yuntang by abstaining from miserliness or stinginess and being set yutta, being uh, sticking to this principle of giving up stinginess. Satchang, he was truthful, and koda bibung, he was the master of his anger. 
ังเวเดวาตาวติงซา Thus he became the angel of the Tabatingsa. So the the explanation is that these are things that he developed for his whole life. For as long as his life lasts, this is what the Buddha says. How he became the king of the gods for as long as his life lasted, the whole of his life he always respected. He always took care of his parents. He never gave gave up this responsibility. This is important in Buddhism as well as various religious traditions. It's, it's, you might even say that it doesn't come from religion, it comes from years and years of cultural um, development. The idea that our parents have done something very important uh, towards us. They've done something very benefit, they've been of great benefit to us. They're our first teachers, our mother who carried us around even before she had met us. She carried us around for nine months and had to suffer a lot for us for nine months, then go through the suffering of childbirth, and even after that, didn't discard us, didn't didn't uh, didn't abandon us, and kept looking after us and taking care of us for how many years uh, until we were able to walk and talk and learn and live on our own. So, as a result of this, a cultural the cultural norm is in in most societies is to respect and take care of your parents when they get old. It's something that you can think of as uh, something that, that creates a normal society. When, when parents have looked after their children and then children don't look after their parents, this is something that disrupts society. It sets an example for children. There are many, this is obviously a worldly thing, it's not a meditation teaching. During your meditation practice you don't want to take care of your parents, you want to uh, spend your time clearing, cleaning your own mind. But in a worldly sense, and, and in, in terms of living our lives, uh, this is something that creates a normal society, creates harmony, creates happiness, and it develops a grateful mi a mind of gratitude where we, we understand the goodness that people have done for us. It respects the law of karma because uh, the, the deeds that they, these people have done for us is something that is very difficult for us to repay. We can never do the same deeds for them, carrying them in our stomach and and taking caring for them when they're invalid and so on. So this idea of taking care of your parents is, is something that is a, a sign of, of develop, a developed person because they understand the harmony that cr it creates, how it creates a good example for society, for one's own children, and it creates a normal society, how it, how it serves to repay the kindness that these people have done for us without ever asking for anything in return. It's something that you actually realize in the meditation. If you've had problems with your parents, this is something that comes out quite strongly in the meditation and generally people want to go back and ask forgiveness from their parents. When people become monks in, in Buddhist countries, they're, they're generally required to ask forgiveness of their parents before they ordain. And if you've ever seen the ceremonies, you see a whole row, if they ordain, sometimes they'll ordain many, many novices, you'll see a whole row of them cry when they when it comes time to pay respect to, to, to ask forgiveness of their parents. And the parents cry and the children cry. It's, it's a wonderful sight to, to see. Because up until that time they hadn't really paid so, so much respect to them and now it all kind of comes back to them. The love and the, the kindness and the, the, the love that they have for each other. So, this is the first one. The second one, Kule Jeta Pachayi Nang. This is Pachayi Nang. This is uh, respect for one's elders. This is another social norm. So again, our goal in, in, in the practice is not to become king of the gods. And so sometimes we can think, well, respecting your elders is, is, is something that you have to be discerning about. It may be that your elders um, have less wisdom than you or have less capability or so on. But again, this is something that creates harmony in the world, and it is something that we consider to be a sign of a developed person, that they don't put themselves above others. They, don't, they aren't always thinking about comparing themselves to others. They respect the social norm of, of seniority. This is why for monks, even though an enlightened, uh, an enlightened uh, a, a young enlightened monk, even though he may be enlightened, and he, he still has to pay respect and bow down to the senior monks who are, who are unenlightened, to any senior monk who is unenlightened. 
and he gladly does so because, of course, he has no conceit left. It's only the people who are truly conceited who try to rise above. And you see this in, in monastic societies and you see this in the world where people begin to lose respect for their elders and it creates chaos. It creates. It is based totally on, on our own ego, our belief that we're better than others and the idea that it should go by uh, some subjective idea of qualifications and so on. And so now, now we go simply by qualifications and we create a great disturbance in society. So this is something that keeps you from finding peace in society. This is a, something that leads people to, uh, uh, to distress and to suffering. So keeping this, this quality that, that they say he had, is something that uh, leads one to, to rise higher and be well esteemed in society and eventually even go to heaven. Again, understanding that the path to heaven is only uh, a worldly thing. Uh, and here we get into something a little more universal, is the kind and gentle speech. Because this is, of course, something that we would really hope to get from the practice, regardless of the other ones. Uh, although I, I would, I would uh, submit to you that through your practice you will come to have more respect for your parents and the, you know, more of a desire to be kind to them for the goodness that they've done to you. And more respect for your elders. You're more willing to bend your back. No? In meditation you do a lot of... Uh, your back becomes more supple. No? You get less stiff back, less stiff shoulder. And you're able to bend down to other people. Even though you may not uh, consider them to be a, a worthy person, you still consider that they have seniority, they're older than you, uh, and so you pay respect to them. So and you see the monks will always do this. But here, this one is, is much more a sign of a person's uh, inner, inner qualities, is their speech. Because a person can take care of their parents and, and put on a show, but the kind speech is starting to get closer to, to what's going on in their mind. If a person is given to harsh speech and, and angry speech and, and harmful speech, speech that is, um, that is, that is harmful to other, others, that we, we encounter on a daily basis in the world, from people who say things to hurt us or say things with uh, with, with bad intentions towards us. Uh, so this is a, this is a, some, a way of differentiating between a developed person and an undeveloped person. And the other one is is slander. So giving up slander because it's very easy to to fall into saying nasty things about other people. It takes a developed person to be able to. Uh, w to hold back and not say th these, uh, these things about others, to be able to say kind things, or if there's nothing kind to say, to not say anything. Now, of course, warning people off of, off of bad people, and you know, saying you have to be careful of that person, this and this and this, but uh, the, the meaning of slander is when you, you have the intention of trying to manipulate people, and break people up, divide people, when you have two friends and you feel jealous, People will try to break them up to try to try to become the, the friend. You want know, to break these friends up so that you can get friends for yourself. This kind of thing. He abstained from for his whole life. These were, these were principles that he upheld. And number five, he upheld the principle of, of generosity. So he was always generous. And this is what we're going to get into in the story, to see his generous deeds. It's actually quite... Uh, quite noble, but he was never stingy, so he was always giving and, and always thinking of other people. When there was something that other people needed, he would always be trying his best. So when he didn't want to give, he would always you know, push that aside and, 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 and give. If it was giving his help, if it was giving his support, giving kind words or giving material support, uh, giving food and lodging and so on, he, was happy. He, he always inclined towards doing that, towards giving up, towards letting go towards generosity and beneficence, which of course led him to have abundance uh, in, in heaven. Number six, Satchang, he was always truthful. He up upheld the, uh, the principle of always telling the truth, never lying. And number seven, he... Uh, number seven, he was the master of his anger. So it doesn't mean he didn't get anger. He wasn't even enlightened at this point. 
But the reason he was able to become enlightened quite easy and go to, and go to heaven besides was because of his dedication to this principle. Even people who have practiced meditation, when you go home, it doesn't mean you're not going to get angry. But what you start to see is the danger of anger. You come to realize the negative side of anger, and so you don't want to chase after it. You still get angry, but whereas before you would say nasty things or do nasty things based on it, now you are able to stop yourself. And all you want to do is be free from the anger. You don't want to use the anger on someone else or hurt other people. What you, your, your desire is... Your desire has changed through the meditation. You only have the desire to be free from anger, to give it up when it arises. So he was able to do that, and he was able to uh, stop himself. And he, the, the text says, he made the wish in his life that whenever anger arises, sachepi me kodho, if anger should arise for me, may I, uh, may I be able to be rid of it. May it leave me quickly. May, may I quickly, may it quickly uh, be gone. So these are the seven things. Now what did he actually do? We have some stories about what he actually did. There was, he was a merchant and in, in that time everyone had to conduct business and they had this, so they had this area where they would conduct business. And he went early and he cleared out a spot for himself and uh, um, stamped down the ground and, and, and swept away the leaves and so on. Got it all ready and as he was putting the, the, the broom away or whatever, another man came and stood in the spot that he cleared. So maybe he got a little angry but he said no. He said, good, okay. And so he went and cleared another spot and he thought to himself, I give that spot to him. I'm not going to cling to it. Give that spot to him. So he went and cleared another spot. Finished cleaning the second spot, another man went there. Because people start to come, no? And when they see this nice open spot, they set up their shop there. And again and again he did this, and finally he realized, you know, th these, this is what people want, and this is something that, this is a work that I could do. Rather than trying to sell things or so on, I could work to provide these people a good place to set up their, their shop, and, and many other things besides. So rather than getting angry, we have this story of how when when people took advantage of him, you know, he did something and for for himself, and people took it away from him. He turned it into the idea that he would he, he would instead, because people always want this, they always want things, you know, that he would help people. So he took to clearing the roads and clearing the area and clearing the the leaves and so on, setting up drinking water, and he set up this place for people to to do their business. It's interesting, you'd think that he'd be wasting his time when he could be making money. But actually, the funny, the, the way it goes is often like this. We don't see it nowadays because everyone is so set on the other way. You know, and greed in business is all about greed. And so we think the person who gets ahead is the, the dog who eats the dog. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. But here's a good example, and you can see this in the world. If you're strong and if you're strict in your goodness, that really people start to respect you and as as the verse says people begin to praise you when you're vigilant in, in goodness in the, in the development of good things people saw him saw him doing this and a, another man said you know what are you doing he said well i'm i'm paving the way to heaven is what he said I, can i help sure you can help and so the second man joined him and they started clearing and doing good deeds setting up water for people and setting up a good place to visit a business and the first thing you can imagine is that suddenly this place that was probably not a nice place to do business from the sounds of it it always had to be cleared so it wasn't uh, well established it was probably some poor out outlying district uh, village or something suddenly became a market right because these people they, they set up these things that a government would ordinarily set up the reason why government local governments will set up these you know, rest houses and what drinking water and so on is because it attracts business, right? And so as a result, their town became flourishing. And they became well respected. And it, it wasn't just two of them. As more people saw it, it turned out that there were actually 32 other people. 32 or 33, I can't remember. I think Magawa, Maga was the 30, or Magawa was the 33rd. And that's why Tawatingsa, the heaven of the 33, there's these 33 of them who went to this heaven. 
by doing that. Now, the, the headman of the village, the story goes, didn't like this so much. Yes, the, the, the way, the, what it says in here is, he, he, thinks to, he sees these guys doing this, and he thinks to himself, hmm, these guys aren't acting like, uh, like the rest of the people. And he was thinking, when, when everyone was going off into the forest and hunting, hunting animals and drinking strong alcohol and making, making alcohol and so on, I could always get something from them. You know, they, when, when they were negligent in this way, I could always take advantage of it because you can tax it and so on. But now they're not doing anything, I can't tax them at all. They're doing good things all the time. I don't get anything from them. So he couldn't see the benefit to his village. And so he came to them, he said, what are you, he, he called them and he said, what are you doing? They said, we're paving the way to heaven. And he said, stop it, stop it, don't do this. Go, go hunt in the forest, make strong alcohol, make strong drink and so on. Act the way everyone else does. And they, they said, oh no, no, that's not, that's not the way to heaven. And he, and so he asked them, and he, he repeatedly, you know, on several occasions, he encouraged them to do this, and they wouldn't do it. And so he got upset, and he said, he got very angry, actually, and he said, I'll just, I'm going to destroy these guys. These guys are a danger to me, a danger in other ways, because they'd start to get other people to, to follow after them, and, and they would stop respecting this guy, or, or stop, they would, would no, no longer be under the power of this evil village headman. You know, corrupt people. It's interesting, it has implications in how we see politics. You could look at politics in the same way. Politicians need people to be corrupt. You know? The idea of, of consumerism. You know? The business bu corporations rely on people to have greed. You know? Economy relies on people to have greed and, and, and attachment. And so they want to encourage people to, uh, to go out and spend and so on, to, to live beyond their means how the government benefits from people's uh, bad deeds. Of course, the tobacco industry, the al uh, alcohol and so on, it, it all gets taxed. And so actually, if people stop taking, uh, ta taking uh, tobacco and, and, and alcohol and, uh, and all sorts of bad things, the government would, be, would start to lose money. And this kind of thing you can see, that it can happen, that the government can be quite corrupt and depend on people's corruption. So he went to the king and he said there were these thieves. There was this band of thieves in his village. And the king, the king said, really? Do you know where they are? He said, yes, yes. Okay, then take these men and round them up. So he took some soldiers and rounded up these 33 miscreants and brought them to the king. And the king, without even investigating, he said, have them trampled by elephants. And this was the, the way of killing people because he didn't have to use humans. He just put them tie them up and lay them on the ground and have elephants run over them. I guess elephants like to trample people. So they did this and uh, tied them up and put them there and, and Magava said to his friends, he said, look, we have no defense now. And this is all, something you'll often hear Buddhists say. We have no defense left now except our love. And so it is our love that we should use as our weapon to defend ourselves in this case. Send loving kindness to the king, to the headman, and to the elephant. Harbor no evil. Remember the story of Samavati, she did the same thing. When, when they passed away, they, well, no, actually they practiced meditation, became enlightened. But he didn't know how to practice, he had no teaching from the Buddha, so all he had was, was their kindness. Send this out. The elephant came out, stopped before it got to them and just stood there, refused, even though they pushed it and, and poked it, refused to step on these men. And they said, what's going on? Something's wrong. So they put out these grass mats. They said, it must not want to step on humans, so we'll just hide the humans and then we'll drive them out again. They drove them out again, stopped at the grass mats, didn't even step on the grass mat. They went back and told the king. The king said, there must be, these guys must have some spell, some magical spell. He went and asked them, and they said, no, you're, no, sir, we have no magical spell, but we have love and we have kindness. And because of our kindness and because of the goodness, we've never done any harm to any being. Therefore, these elephants don't trample on us. So you, have, you believe it or not, but you can consider this was a very powerful goodness that they had developed. This, was this altruism that they had uh, had led them to this this state of being able to even change the minds of animals. 
And the king was, was uh, mortified and said, even these dumb animals know a good person when they see them. And me, I, I haven't a clue. And he said, please tell me, uh, t tell me what, 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 is this, what is the story here? Why were you uh, thought to be thieves? And they explained that this headman was not getting any benefit from them, so he was angry and so he lied to the king. So the king gave the village to them and gave the headman as their slave, and, and these 33 became the head of the village. And after that, they really started doing good stuff. They built a pavilion, and so on and so on. The story goes on and on. And then it goes on to Afi, became Saka, and there's the war between the gods and the, and the, the fallen angels, and so on and so on. But we won't get into that. The point is to understand how Saka became, how Magawa became king of the gods. The, as the Buddha said, the Buddha pointed out something special. And of course the Buddha is here thinking as, as I am and as we all are about how this relates to our meditation. So he pointed out that this is an example of someone who has what we call appamada, which is uh, heedfulness or vigilance, being always alert and always aware and always on guard, always reminding yourself of the task at hand, always coming back, this... Uh, vigilant or heedful state where everything you do you're trying you're 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 being mindful of it. When you're walking you're mindful. When you're talking you're mindful. When seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling and thinking, trying to be mindful at all times of everything that goes on. This is what we mean by Appamada. As the Buddha said actually the meaning of Appamada is to always be mindful. Someone who is never without mindfulness and awareness of what they're doing as Saka was in a way, even though he hadn't practiced meditation. He was always aware of the benefits and always thinking about this is leading me to good things. And when a bad thing came up like anger, he always was quick to cut it off and he always made a wish that if it arose, may he be quick to cut it off. As a result, he became the Devanang Seta, seta. Devanang Seta Tangato. He went to the highest of angels. Then the Buddha gives his teaching, which is something for us to remember, that appamadang pasang samti, the uh, heedfulness, vigilance is ever praised, pamado garahito sada, and negligence is ever despised or, or scorned. So, how this relates to our practice, as I said, it's related in terms of being an example for us. The kind of person that we want to be is a person who is helpful in society, who is, after we leave this place and go out in the world, or, or as we, when we ordain, when we go out and, and, and encounter other people, or even people who come to the monastery, we can think of these principles of helping other people, of being kind and courteous, of thinking in terms of being generous towards them. What can we give to these people? What can we do for them? And if everyone thinks like that, if, 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 if all people were to think like that, of course the world would be a, a, a wonderful place to live. And so this is what we want to uh, bring into the society. This is what we want for ourselves. This is what we want to bring to other people. And this is what we, uh, this is the kind of person that we would like to be. The other thing is just simply taking it as a reminder for ourselves that in everything we do we should always know the benefits of it and the detriment of it. When we do something un unwholesome we should be quick to realize it as unwholesome. And, and so this Buddha, the Buddha's teaching on always being vigilant, being aware of what you're doing. When you fall into a bad way, be quick. When you, when you are given the opportunity to do something uh, unwholesome, be discerning about it. And, and this comes down to a moment-to-moment -moment basis in our meditation. When something comes up that makes you angry, be quick to catch it. When something comes up that makes you greedy, be quick to catch it and be vigilant. Vigilant in breaking it up into pieces. You have the contact. When the mind makes contact with the object, you have the, the awareness that comes from it. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. You have the feeling that comes from the contact. Happiness, unhappiness, uh, calm. Or neutral feeling and then you have the desire the craving that comes craving for it to be more which is greed craving for it to go away which is anger uh, you have greed you have anger you have delusion 
and therefore as a result you have uh, well, leads to suffering. So even in our meditation practice we can see these principles um, coming into play and, and we can we, 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 we must if our practice is to succeed develop this state of vigilance where we're constantly bringing our mind back, bringing our mind back to what we're doing and seeing the benefit of it. So we have an example of a very good person gives us the idea that we can, we can, we too can become a great person in the world. Not just an ordinary, not just a good person, but we can become special. And if we develop ourselves to a great extent, we can become an example for others. We can become a role model. And as the Buddha said, it, we become someone who is a, a leader. Um, we become someone who is pasang santi, who is praised, who is spoken highly of, who is esteemed. And if we don't, if we're negligent, we will become despised and scorned. So, that's the teaching for today. Thanks for uh, listening and coming out, and thank you for your meditation practice and continuing to develop yourselves as good people. Let's uh, continue on in this way and um, try to do something to make the world a better place and to make ourselves better people. Well, see you next time.